Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Claire Ellicott, and the Daily Mail's delightful editor. I write extensively about the environment, and today we've got a panel on um, rivers and how can Labour rescue Britain's rivers without breaking the bank. And we have Mark Lloyd, who is the chief executive of the Rivers Trust, Emma Hardy, who's the Minister for Water and Flooding. We've got um, Joe Harrison, who's the Asset Management Director for United Utilities. We've got Alex Mayer, who is the MP for Dunstable and Leighton Buzzard. And we have Victoria Vivian, who is the president for the Country Land and Business Association. And I'm just going to start today by asking the central question, starting with Mark, mm -hmm. of how Labour can rescue British rivers. Well, thank you very much and, and welcome, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us and thank you to our, our panel. My MP is even in the audience, just taking a picture at the moment. <laughs> uh, it's great. Um, and um, yeah, river health is is really a kind of wicked problem. Um, it's incredibly complex and we face kind of multiple huge challenges all at once. So um, uh, drought, we're predicting a one to three billion um, litre shortfall by 2050. And in fact, this is much more imminent than that sounds. Um, London very nearly ran out of water in 2012, just as we we're about to host the Olympics. Um, so, um, and that has a huge implication for health of rivers. We face uh, increasing flood risk as a result of climate change, both from surface water and, and river water. And that brings untold misery to, uh, to, to, to huge numbers of people and, and holds back business. Um, pollution, we have made um, progress, in fact, in many areas, and that's often uh, forgotten. Um, but agricultural pollution has got a lot worse in recent decades. Um, and uh, chemical pollution is getting worse and we're getting more complex chemicals coming out, which have complex interactions between each other. And of course, we have the persistent sewage overflows um, which um, cause public health issues and and, um, uh, and uh, obviously revulsion from from people um, uh, using rivers. But they are by no means the biggest problem. They are really um, a sideshow in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the health of rivers. And the natural functions of rivers and catchments have been destroyed by our actions over many years. So we canalise rivers, we dam them, um, we hurry water off the land and out to sea. Um, and to compound the doom, uh, we, we also are in a climate um, and uh, biodiversity crisis and we have international obligations um, to net zero um, and nature recovery and ambitious growth and housing targets to meet. There's limited public money. We, we know the fiscal position um, uh, to pay for nature recovery and farmers who really are crucial to um, uh, achieving the change that we need are ever tight, more tightly squeezed by market pressures, higher input, co uh, input costs and, and lower gate prices. Um, and they're facing new obligations um, in order to justify um, the public subsidy they receive. So these are huge strategic um, challenges, um, but I think we can solve them without breaking the bank. Um, and um, I think the, the secret lies in stopping trying to solve them one at a time. So we need to look for collaborative solutions that, that address all these issues simultaneously um, through taking a water systems approach. And currently we have flood defence works being implemented that destroy nature and emit huge amounts of carbon. We have sewage treatment works that emit tonnes of carbon and don't deliver any other, any other benefits. And I read this week that some councils are spending 60% of their budget on funding the internal drainage boards. Um, and what those drainage boards are doing is hurrying water out to sea and other people are spending public money trying to slow water up. So we need to look upstream, we need to look collaboratively um, and to, uh, uh, to make better use of public funds. Water companies are about to spend £88 billion over the next five years, um, and that's welcome investment. Um, but just £2 billion of that is for green solutions, like wetlands, sponge cities, and, and restoring uh, natural rivers. So our rivers will be a bit cleaner as a result of that investment, but good ecological status, the measure that we have for 14% of rivers meet that at the moment uh, um, in England, um, uh, will actually not move as a result of that huge investment. I think people will question that, um, and that gives me concern for the future. So what if that figure of 2 billion for, for nature-based solutions uh, were 10 or 20 billion? 
What if that were joined up with the flood defence budgets, the biodiversity net gain funds, nutrient neutrality and, and carbon offsets to really transform our landscape into something much more nature rich that holds water back? Farmers could be, be, be paid much more than they currently get in, in subsidy to deliver widespread nature recovery, pollution control, flood and drought resilience and aquifer recharge. So we need to build an integrated um, water system and we need to do so urgently. It's wonderful to have so many people here. It's fantastic. And it shows the importance of the rivers. And just to say, I think during the election campaign, it was incredible that this was a huge uh, issue during the election. And when we had the King's speech and it announced, uh, they did some polling on the King's speech and found out which was the most, the issue that resonated the most with the general public. And actually cleaning up our rivers, lakes and seas was the most popular issue uh, that was mentioned in the King's speech. Um, right. So, um, right. So, I mean, let's let's have some good news. So, the good news is cleaning up our rivers, lakes, and seas is the number one priority for DEFRA. When the Secretary of State got into the Department of DEFRA and set his priorities, is that better? Cleaning up rivers, lakes, and seas is absolutely number one. So, the whole of the DEFRA department is now being sort of configured around our priorities, and delivering on this is seen as the most important. And it's seen as the most important for a number of reasons. I think one, because people care about it, as we can tell from the number of people that we have squeezed into this room, people care about it. It resonates with the general public. But also, the reason why it's number one is that the Labour's mission is economic growth. And we cannot have economic growth if we don't have enough water. We can't build 1.5 million homes if we can't guarantee that they're going to have access to fresh water and they're going to have a sewage system that will take that waste away. That's not going to happen. We can't have the businesses that we need either. And then the other reason, of course, is nature's in crisis. As the Secretary of State has talked about this as well, there's a huge crisis in nature. In opposition and both in government, I've talked about how concrete can't always be the answer. Of course, we need some engineering solutions to the problem that we have around water pollution, but it can't be the answer to everything. And as Mark has so uh, clearly articulated, where we can have, and it is possible in this in this uh, brief, to have win-win, you can have a win for nature, you can have a win uh, for water as well, and you can have a win for flooding. Because I think what's definitely on my mind at the moment, unsurprisingly, is last night's floods uh, and what we've woken up to seeing those images on the television. Now, we know as we go into this winter, it has been reported previously that we are going into this winter with some of our flood assets, our high uh, critical flood assets in the worst state of repair that they've been for 14 years. We're also going into this winter with high water tables, so already saturated ground from the summer that we've just had. So when we're talking about cleaning up our water, though, we don't always link it with the fact that we've got a surface water and a flooding problem. And what we're going to have released at the end of uh, December are these new mapping, NAFRA 2, which is going to identify where you can put your postcode in and you can identify your flood risk. But I think what's really special about this is it will also identify your future flood risk because it will include climate change as well. And I think for the first time, people will start to identify where they where they previously never thought they were at risk of flooding, that they're suddenly now at risk of flooding. So Mark's quite right. We need to look at this as a systems change. And there's a few things we need to do. Obviously, we've got the Water Special Measures Bill, which is about restoring accountability. And I hope trust back in the system. I'm a former teacher, so I go with a firm but fair approach, which is be really clear as a department, our expectations, and be firm in enforcing them, that these are our expectations and these are how we'd like to enforce them. The idea being, of course, that we see a culture change across the system. But just to return to the point of systems uh, change, one of the solutions to stopping the use of storm overflows, polluting our rivers, lakes and seas is actually dealing with surface water and dealing with flooding water. And how are we holding this and containing this in our environments? Because if we're able to hold and contain it, and I won't bore on too much about sustainable urban drainage systems, but I'm hoping I'm in the room of people that go, yeah, um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> But, you know, if we start to look at things like that, we're actually going to reduce the amount of water going into the sewage system, which will also help reduce the amount of pollution that comes out the other end of it. If we start to think about our blue green uh, infrastructure and how we're sort of designing our urban environment and, and, and there's so much and, and this can be exciting because wouldn't it be great to put nature back into our cities? 
and create spaces where we can soak away sort of uh, you know excess water but also put nature in there and who wants a grey concrete environment where we can start to put nature in there solving a little bit of the problem about surface water and also dealing with a little bit of the capacity problem for our drains as well that feels like a win-win uh, for everyone so we're going to be launching our reviews uh, the secretary of state's mentioned this and that review i'm hoping i'm not saying things i'm not meant to i'm terrible at this but the um the review is going to look at catchment based approaches we are going to be looking at the whole of the catchment because you can't solve the problem at the point at which you know the, the drain operates and starts to pollute you know, at that point you you've lost we need to be looking further upstream and how can we slow it in some places potentially speed it in other places and the other just just a final thing which i had a really interesting conversation which had actually lots of really interesting conversations lots of interesting people and i was talking to the canal and rivers trust and they were talking to me about the fact that if they said think of our network as being like massive open pipes around the country like we've got the infrastructure to shift water all around the country at speed in a way that we don't think about we think about them instead as being oh that's nice and that's where you go on your canal boat holiday but actually we have other infrastructure there that we're not utilizing and we're not using properly and if we start to think about it more as a systems basis at a catchment basis of how can we use what we've got to move water to the place we want it to be because what we have is where we have too much in one place not enough in somewhere else this is impacting farmers and this is impacting uh, pollution and i'll stop there but yes it's all very interesting and all very exciting wonderful and alex the question how can labor rescue britain's rivers without breaking the pipe brilliant uh, thank you ever so much and thank you for inviting me here today uh, so my name's um, alex mayer um, i am the member of parliament um, for dunstable and leighton buzzard um, somewhat unexpectedly um, i have to say um, i'm the first labor mp for the area since 1966 um, which clearly shows us a couple of things you know we do much better in the world cup when there's a labor mp <laughs> Uh, but also I think kind of how rarely change comes to some communities in the country and change is absolutely um, desperately needed there, uh, not least when it comes to our rivers um, and other waterways. Um, Emma just mentioned canals. We're also um, home to the Grand Union Canal, um, which, which uh, runs through uh, Leighton Buzzard. Um, some reflections, I'd say, as a, as a new member of Parliament. Um, what do you get in your inbox? Actually, you get an awful lot about rivers and pollution. You genuinely do. Quite a lot about wildlife as well, I'd say. Um, but you do get a lot about this. This really is an issue that is of, of concern to people. Um, and it's of concern to me personally, who doesn't want um, to, you know, live in an area um, that's, you know, green pleasant um, and has um, un, un, uh, rivers and other waterways um, that are not um, polluted. The other thing I'd say is that suddenly as a new member of parliament, you're expected to have a view on literally everything. <laughs> <laughs> and for many issues, you know, I find that rather complicated. But again, on this one, it's quite simple, isn't it? Because you don't want um, your natural environment um, to be polluted. Because I think um, our rivers that run through our communities are actually something that people take an enormous pride in. Um, many communities are built there because there is um, a river there. Um, they're good for our health. Um, they're good for mental health um, as well. Uh, people love um, walking along them, around them, enjoying them. Um, and that is what uh, my constituents certainly tell me. What they don't want in them um, is raw sewage. Mm -hmm. um, so the question we were set um, was, of course, how to rescue Britain's rivers without breaking the bank. There's clearly a bit of a problem there because the bank is already broken, as we all know. Um, and I clearly need to talk about our £22 billion um, black hole. Um, you know, it is clear um, that the last government let the water companies off the hook um, and they got away with it far too lightly um, for the last 14 years. And we are in desperate need um, of the new, inf new infrastructure and historically um, there really has been um, a lack of investment. But it isn't something um, that um, can be done alone. Um, it's something where you need so many different stakeholders working together. There needs to be change at so many different levels. We need the water industry to change. Um, we need agriculture to change. We need people to change as well. 
Um, after all, we all, all rely on, on water to do so many things. Um, and um, we need to think about that water that we're using. We clearly don't want the government to change for a little while, but um, <laughs> we're going to have a, a definite change um, of approach um, in, in, in the, the way um, that we're working. Um, so um, I would say, um, again, speaking from the perspective even um, of a new member of parliament, is we do need you to keep up the pressure on us because the other thing you find is quite how many emails um, arrive on so many different varied topics um, and I mean I would say I've had about 5,000 um, since I, I, I got elected um, and you do kind of notice the themes that are arriving in there um, and as I said, one of them definitely is um, the state of, of our rivers, um, but that has got to keep on um, carrying on um, through um, the, the, the time that we are going to be in government. Uh, the other thing I suppose I also add is that my constituency, like many others, um, is underwater at the moment. Mm. We managed it slightly earlier. Um, I actually sent you an email, um, Emma, I think on Sunday afternoon uh, when Dunstable High Street um, was turned literally into a river. I mean, you know, there are cars and vans floating along it the impact that that is having on the shops the businesses the homes there it is utterly devastating and the topic here is of course about not breaking the bank well the economic impact of the flooding that you know the people in my area are seeing that has to be a, a knock-on um, consequence as well so this clearly can't just be a defra issue it, it's it's so many other departments as well so we need when we're talking about the new houses that we're that we're building and planning to build you know it is a housing issue too it's an economic issue it's a culture media and sport issue um and it is something that i am absolutely confident that this government is going to get a grip on because it is so important to so many people's lives so thank you very much and um, can I ask you, Victoria, that can labour rescue Yes, so that... um, I think the people who go at the end have loads of little notes they have to integrate <laughs> in their first five sentences. <laughs> quite, quite I'm here really to represent the people who do the doing. There's lots of people who do the talking, but the people who are members of our organisation walk out of their back door covered in wellies and waterproofs and try and do something about it. So, uh, so I think that's my, my first, what, what we all want is an integrated catchment based yes. system. You know, that that's a holistic one and that's got to include the people who are delivering it on the ground and by far the most efficient people to deliver it on the ground are the ones at a regional and local level particularly when you look at farm clusters where we can actually gather impact together by scaling up and scaling up and scaling up we even now have super clusters i think the martin down cluster has about fourteen thousand uh, acres in it so that so let's look at how people are already working together because the question is, let's not break the bank. They've politely put it at the back end of the sentence as the subordinate part, but actually it's the main clause. Let's not break the bank. Hey. So let's look at, uh, first of all, I'm afraid I do have to come back to Mark. We don't have subsidies, or at least the subsidy will disappear in two years' time. We now have contracts with government to deliver a public benefit. If we continue to use language like subsidy, we continue to make farmers and land managers feel like pensioners of the state and that's not a healthy place for everybody to be we've changed that system we've just we, we've collectively government and stakeholders decided that we will do the things that the public need doing and we will deliver that uh, instead of being subsidized so let's start with water testing there's really really though what would help us we did a massive um survey of our members about what they could best do themselves to improve water delivery and they said help us to test our water so that we're personally responsible for the results that come out so that we don't have to wait for other people's testing systems give us lidar easily accessible lidar reports so we know where our flooding and runoff problems are likely to be over the next 15 or 20 years this is all about empowering the people who are actually delivering on on the ground um, and so, you know, not all of it. How about we match fund water testing? You know, we're not asked, this is supposed to be how we're going to do this with a reasonable price. Second, let's continue with the schemes that we've got in place at the moment. Uh, they have had some teething problems like the slurry infrastructure fund. I think this very august meeting needs the word slurry. Um, so the slurry is, was about extending the size and covering our, our slurry pits great incentive to do it uh, from from DEFRA but the planning comes after 
you've already got permission and runs out before the grant has actually implemented. So there's this terrible dysfunction there. So let's continue with covering our slurry pits. But let's have some investment in something which could make money. If the tech could be delivered to change slurry and manure into a deliverable, transportable uh, fertilizer for the eastern country where they have less livestock, that is an industry rather than a liability that's growing there. Um, we have, we want to consolidate the rules. The farming rules for water are good. They're unpalatable, but they're good. Obviously, you don't want to spread slurry on a steep slope in a downpour because it will just end up back in the river. Mm. So, you know, we need to just, we need to consolidate farming rules for water and make them, uh, make them straightforward to use. And we want the people who come out from the Environment Agency not to be coming out waving a stick, but coming out helpfully talking to us about, for example, in a dairy yard, a bit like a housing development, how do you have water runoff going into these slurry pits? What can we do to change that? How can we help that very localised drainage? So the fund, I've covered funding for research there. And finally, the most important thing, I was asked a question at the Chalk Valley History Festival the other day. Uh, uh, somebody said, what are you going to do? What are you farmers going to do when there are submarines in the North Sea? And there are all kinds of answers to that. But the wonderful farmer sitting to my right, called Becky Berry, said, I'll tell you what, when the time comes, I will have the soils to deliver whatever you want. So soil, soil, soil is the answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. And um, an industry perspective too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here. So, um, as a sort of member of the water industry, you know, one of the things that we really have to think about is that we are absolutely reliant on the natural environment for everything we do, from providing robust long term water resources, um, for ensuring that we can effectively drain um, the landscapes in which we operate, for protecting people from flooding, um, and from thinking about how we improve the quality of water. So the natural environment is absolutely fundamental to us. But for a very long time, we've thought about all of those problems very separately. Um, and so of our regulators, and so of many of the other organisations that we work with. And so I really want to sort of echo what everybody has said here. We can't think of water as a flooding problem or a resources problem or a pollution problem. We have to think about managing water in the landscape in catchments holistically together. Um, and that's how we're going to sort of drive a difference going forward. And it's really critical because every aspect of what a water company does and needs to deliver is going to be impacted by climate change in the long term. So if we don't just produce plans, investment plans for now and for the next five years, we're looking at what we need to do over the next hundred years. And so really focusing on how we drive resilient catchments is absolutely critical to what we do. Um, and all companies are, are looking at this across the country. At, at United Utilities, we call it catchment systems thinking. And so we've done lots of work with various different stakeholders across the region to look at how we can work differently. And I'd just like to talk about one example that we've got where we're working in differently in Greater Manchester. So we have developed, um, working with the combined authority in Greater Manchester um, and the Environment Agency, um, a trilateral partnership. And we are delivering what we are calling an integrated water management plan for, for the city. So that is trying to do something really different to say, let's put all of our differences aside. Let's co-locate people in shared offices so we can actually think about this water problem. Because for those of you who don't know Greater Manchester, it's surrounded by the Pennines. Um, it's got wonderful peatland um, above it, um, which has been degraded by the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then we've got, you know, obviously a huge amount of sort of uh, urban con conurbation and a huge flood risk. So we've got to think about how do we protect the, the homes that are, are in this city from flooding, but also how do we think about the challenges that we've got around CSOs? How will we drive those improvements that are so, so badly needed and, and wanted by everybody? But to remove that quantity of water from our combined Victorian sewerage systems is going to take a completely different way of thinking. And that's why it's so important that we do that together with the, with the local authority. So we're forecasting from our investment that we're going to spend about three billion pounds in Manchester alone, looking at how we drive improvements for our wastewater system. But if we can collaborate with Andy Burnham's team, who've also got a transport budget of one and a half billion, and we can collaborate with the environment agency who have got a flood budget that's really significant too. You've got a huge amount of money 
to reimagine how that urban area is going to look, how we can take surface water out of our sewers, how we can create green infrastructure, sustainable drainage, in order to think differently, to manage water as far back up in the catchment as we possibly can, to ensure that it's clean, that it's sustainable, that it stays in the environment for a really, really long time. And so that's our ambition for, for Greater Manchester. And we think that that's a model that could be rolled out more broadly. And so we're looking at how we do that across the other cities, across the, the northwest. Liverpool is a great example. Liverpool has got 84% of its sewers are combined sewers. Mm. So they take all of the rainfall from the city. There are no little rivers crossing Liverpool until you get to the Mersey. They were all long ago canalised and put into the, the sewer system. So we would have to meet our sort of targets for the future. We estimate we'd have to build 600 Olympic sized swimming pools. Everyone always talks about Olympic sized swimming pools just in Liverpool alone. So we have to think really differently. And we can't do that alone. We have to work with others. Um, and the transport budget is a really great way of doing that. Because if you're re, you know, sewering um, streets there and you can also provide green transport at the same time, what, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. But we also need some help. Um, so we need some of the um, activities, some of the actions that were identified in the Flood and Water Management Act all those years ago, Section 3 um, for the Flood and Water Management Act, which really um, compel people to build sustainable drainage is absolutely imperative and also looking at the right to connect at the moment sewers are open systems everybody has the right to connect to them so if all the highway drainage all the housing development um, is, is just continually connecting then we're sort of fighting a losing battle aren't we we've got to be able to control water um, right at the beginning of the process to be able to actually achieve all of those ambitions that everybody wants to see thank you um, I'm just going to ask a few more questions from the panellists. Joe, you've touched on flooding, Alex, you've touched on flooding, sorry. And can you talk a bit more about your constituents and the effect that River Health is having on that? Absolutely. I mean, this is um, surface water flooding. This is just the sheer volume of rain um, that we had um, on... I've lost, I've lost all track of days because I'm at Labour Party yeah. conference, um, um, I think two days ago. Um, and I mean, you know, um, I was here, I was ringing up and people going, no, it's just raining. It's still raining. You know, we've never seen this amount of rain. Um, it's had a real impact clearly um, on on so many um, businesses, schools closed, local college closed. I was talking to the um, chief executive um, of the of central uh, Bedfordshire um, and their colleges there. Um, so it impacts education, it impacts everything. Um, in terms of um, the rivers and, and canals that we've got um, there as well, I mean, we, we do have river flooding too. We haven't had any actually in, in the last 24 hours, um, but um, we also end up with, with flooding there quite recently. There's also an awful lot of new build in the area. Um, and people are, I actually think rightly, really outraged that um, they were told when these new builds uh, were going up, you know, that everything was going to be all right, you know, and, and they are simply not. So we are seeing brand new houses um, flooded and the infrastructure that's got in, gone in around there just hasn't worked. Um, and people, you know, the, these are not one off events. Yes, this is more water than anyone has seen, um, you know, basically in living memory. Um, but <laughs> over the last 48 hours, but this this is the impact of climate change. We're going to see more and more of these severe weather events and we need to make sure that we've got the infrastructure and the resilience to deal with that because these are not going to be one off events or events that happen every 50 years. We're going to see more and more of that. So we've got to make sure um, that that um, the impact of that is that there is somewhere for all of that water to go, um, you know, uh, and go slowly until it gets into our, our rivers. Um, and that that doesn't mean going into people's houses and businesses, because that is just not sustainable. Um, and we are, as everyone has said, in the midst of that climate and biodiversity emergency, and it isn't something that is going to end soon. So we've got to make sure uh, that we come up with some solutions. Of course, one of the problems now is that we're in government. Um, uh, it's so easy when you're in opposition to say something must be done now we're the people who've got to do that something specifically Emma's got to do that that something um, uh, but I have to say that I am really confident because it is such a topic of conversation um, in Westminster um, 
it is it really does feel like it's at the top of the agenda um so i i, I am of the belief that something is going to be done <laughs> Good. Um, Mark, can you tell us a bit more about nature-based solutions to um, solving my burning? Sure. Um, I mean, there's a there's a long list of nature-based solutions because it is basically ecology. Um, I mean, it's really anything that restores um, uh, natural functions to our to our landscape. So, I mean, the obvious ones are wetlands, trees, um, hedges leaky dams, which are sort of bundles of twigs that, that people fix into uh, into streams to hold back the, the water when it's a high flow, uh, ponds um, and scrapes. So anything that slows the flow, that purifies water naturally, that locks up carbon um, in the ground, uh, recharges aquifer and, and restores uh, nature to our land. Beavers. Um, <laughs> beavers are a controversial example. Uh, thank you for my friend. Uh, uh, from who we used to be at Beaver Trust. Um, uh, Rewetting peas, as we've heard, is is a fantastic way of doing that, and it stores a lot of carbon um, and water, and it improves water quality because you don't get these kind of acid flushes, uh, which happen when peat degrades, um, and it puts acid water down down rivers. But we have limited peat areas, and and I was really pleased to hear Victoria talking about um, the value of soil, um, and soil is a huge opportunity. Um, uh, and a much, much larger area. And degraded soils have as little as, as 0.5% carbon content. And you can push that up relatively easy to 5%, even to 10%. And if you think of that in the top 30 centimetres of soil across our countryside, there is a vast opportunity to make a really meaningful impact on our carbon targets. Um, and it has huge benefits. So 1% increase in carbon in soils increases its capacity by 25,000 gallons per acre. That's great. That's a statistic. Backs up exactly what I was going to say. Very <laughs> much. Um, so um, yeah, it improves soil structure, prevents runoff and, and erosion of soil, which is a huge impact on, on the ecology of rivers. It blocks up the the gravel in rivers and stops, which is where fish lay their eggs and invertebrates uh, hang out. Um, and it retains water, as we've heard, um, which means that farmers need less water for irrigation, um, and that water can, can be slowly released when it comes out cooler into rivers from the ground than it does from the surface, which means that there's more oxygen in the water. So these, these, these combination of benefits. But the real benefit from soil is on flood risk. Um, so a healthy soil, even when it's saturated, when you hear on the weather forecast, they say, oh, well, the soil's saturated, so we're going to have flooding. But actually, healthy soils, even when saturated, can absorb about half an inch of rain an hour. So, but a, a, a compacted soil is effectively concrete, has a zero infiltration rate. So every drop of rain that lands runs off the surface, taking with it pollutants and causing massive flood risk. And when we get these kind of atmospheric rivers that we're going to see with, with climate change, we need to have um, really good resilience across our landscape. But healthy soils are absolutely fundamental to that. Some nature-based solutions are sort of hybrid, so they involve quite a lot of engineering work, and I've seen them being implemented in Mansfield by um, Seven Trent, who got some um, uh, green recovery funding um, to to you know take a really fundamental look at at, uh, at how that urban landscape is, and it's very engineered, but it involves storing a lot of water underground. Some of it does involve um, uh, some nature. Um, but it's really about having soakable areas, permeable paving, and, and reducing the loading on the sewers, but also reducing that surface water water risk. And if they do have nature in, as Emma said, it can cool urban areas, bring nature into nature, deprive communities. A lot of people don't see any nature mm -hmm. at all. Um, and, uh, you know, that has huge knock-on effects for things like crime and, and, uh, and fear of crime. So these are multiple benefits, but if we're going to have all these multiple benefits, it needs to be funded by lots of different parties. We need to have a mechanism to bring together the, um, the different sources of funding so that the risk of implementing these, these things is shared and the cost is shared by, by multiple sectors. And then we can get this kind of much more than the sum of the parts um, out outcome. And we need to deliver them at scale. At the moment, we're kind of fiddling around with with pilot projects, you know, the Rivers Trust does this kind of partnership working all the time. But our work is, you know, it's about 70 million a year. But it's, you know, we need to spend um, two zip, put two zeros on that um, uh, if, if we're going to start having an impact. 
and that requires a new governance system and i'm really delighted to get the minister talking about a catchment based approach we have catchment partnerships which are, are woefully underfunded but i think we need a sort of a regional scale to bring together those catchment partnerships develop investable propositions there's a lot of green finance out there but it needs to be big enough and have enough big budgets combined for that to be something which is going to attract the kind of big money from the city but i'm really hopeful we can do that through the um uh, the water systems uh, legislation which i'm delighted to say we're going to be um, involved in sort of co-creating and i love the approach that uh, this government has taken to collaborative policy development rather than just releasing some legislation and then uh, and then running consultation so i'm um, really really pleased to be in at the beginning of that policy funnel um, and there are some concerns that the water industry is maybe spending a tiny proportion of its funding on green solutions over the next few years is that something you're concerned about do you want to see more of that is that a better long-term solution yeah and I, can i just talk about flooding for one moment yes. is that is that all right <laughs> great um, just on the issue of flooding and, and flash flooding, I think I'd like more people to be aware of the Build Back Better from the insurance industry. So, and this is something that I'd want to become mainstream. So go away and, and everyone shout about this, please. So what's how it happens at the moment is anyone who's been who's been a victim of flooding is should be able to get an extra ten thousand pounds to build back better and to improve flood resilience to their property after they've been flooded this is homes not businesses and yet not many people are accessing this not many people are using this build back better fund and that's partly because nobody really knows that this fund actually exists to improve um, flood resilience so I think it's really important that we raise education amongst everybody that this money is available to put in, excuse me, to put in measures to make homes more uh, flood resilient. And we've got Flood Action Week, and we have to plug that as well. Flood Action Week coming up, and I think for Flood Action Week it would be really good as members. I will drink some more. It's the conference. You just run out. You always lose your voice at conference to make this more of a mainstream thing. So I want property flood resilience to become mainstream. I want build back better to become mainstream. And I think that I'm having I had a ins flood insurance round table talking to them about what more insurance companies can do to ensure that people are aware that they can access this money, that they're aware that they can use this to improve the resilience of their property. And I think that's so important because more and more people are going to become victims of flooding where they didn't previously expect to be especially if they're not by rivers and it's because of flash flooding so we need to be pushing this about how we can improve uh flood resilience so i, I and i hope each and every one of us has a role to play in flood action week to really talk about this because no one really knows very few people are signed up to flood alerts nobody really has an understanding of what to do when it floods when we when i was a teacher we used to do uh fire plans with the children i taught infants i should say as well before you might think why were you doing that with teenagers um so and we would talk about you know what happens if there's a fire how do you get out your home and who do you go and see and what should you do we don't do anything like that for flooding nobody sort of thinks about how they prepare themselves for a flood and i think because it's flooding is is going to be inevitable for many many people because our climate is changing Therefore, we need to be thinking about this as something that we need to all prepare for. So sorry, that wasn't the answer to your question, but I just well, I wanted to talk about flooding because it's very much at the forefront of, of my mind. And now I've completely forgot what it was that you actually asked me. Well, so, we're going to talk about green solutions. But actually, Joe, do you want to come in on this? Because if you do you think the water industry should be spending more on green? A absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, you know, don't get me wrong it's to be able to deliver and meet the challenges that of the sort of cso crisis that we are going to have to deliver some civil engineering yes but we really want to deliver as much green infrastructure as we possibly can yeah. because at the end of the day what we don't want to do is have huge disruption about build expensive tanks and store which what is virtually clean storm water and then pump it using a lot of carbon a lot of electricity down to a treatment works where you've got very intensive carbon intensive processes to treat it so really the solution is to take out as much surface water as we possibly can mm -hmm. and that's what the, the industry will be doing through sustainable drainage but it takes longer for us to develop those ideas because that's it's, it's a new way of thinking you need to work with stakeholders so we need to have the time to be able to, to think about what that might look like 
one of the things that we've got in the northwest is a, a unique opportunity which is called the advanced twin app which won't mean anything to most of you but it's a new way of working with the environment agency so it's basically allowing us to look at some of our longer term challenges in 10 years time and start investing to take water out of the the net surface water out of the networks to help protect homes where we don't necessarily have a very very short um, regulatory date we've got to meet so we can take a longer time to think about how we develop the infrastructure into a, a better position so one of the things that we're sort of trying to deal with in terms of proliferating nature-based solutions is some of the, the regulatory bureaucracy that we have that is sort of impacting and limiting us so we have very, very tight um, regulatory deadlines. So a lot of the investment has to be delivered within two years or three years. So that doesn't really allow time for creativity and innovation and to develop those stakeholder networks that you need to, to really do things differently. And so that's when companies will revert to engineering because actually if we've got to do something within two years. We know how to build tanks. Um, and so that's that's one of the things that we need to sort of look at. The other thing is that you can also use nature based solutions to improve um, River water quality so we can use it instead of intensive processes at our treatment works to remove nutrients in particular um but that this is where our regulators get a bit nervous because mm. or if we build a chemical treatment plant at a wastewater treatment works we know that it will hit the phosphorus target that we've got to meet if we build a reed bed we haven't got quite as much evidence and experience across the industry to know that it, it, we can precisely achieve that mm. but we are getting more and more of that with time so I think there's a little bit about let's innovate, let's create, let's be given the opportunity in a sort of a, a, a sort of safer space to be able to deliver some of those things that are going to deliver so many benefits. And you know we've done a lot of work in the northwest, in the River Petrol, um, up in Cumbria, which is is really delivered so much more in terms of the improvements to taking phosphorus out of the River Petrol. Um, Anglian Water have done some great things in Goldisthorpe. You know there are lots of examples around. Um, around the country, but they are pilots. And the chair of the um, Institute of Civil Engineering said, said um, a great quote the other day, there are more pilots in the water industry than there are in the aviation industry. We need to step away from you know, all of these pilots and say, this has got to be business as usual, and how do we get regulatory environment in which we can, we can do that? Thank you. Now, Victoria, can you tell us a bit more about how central land is to keeping this was a moment to, to again to move away from ideas a bit into into doing my question was what's the best judicious use of, of land and of course they aren't making any more of it mm -hmm. so we do have to be very careful i'm i'm relatively cautious about top-down hierarchies of land use because i i fear that over a period of 25 years which is short in terms of land management planning they might become victims of, of, of ideologies instead of the collective good so i think that's quite a difficult area my children always say to me but i mean you're so solutions orientated and i am a bit <laughs> solutions orientated i i tend to see most things as symptoms of deeper problems that we need to find find answers to and, and we definitely need to slow the water down upstream and and that will really help with a, a lot of these problems i think can't oh, build a woody dam on Dartmoor. I grew up on Dartmoor. Oh, what I slow the water down is piles of, of lovely granite uh, in, to try and slow that water down. And we need to speed it up at the bottom end. We need to, you know, our members need that water not to hang around on, on the ground. And there's a lot of work that can be done with Washland agreements, you know, so that we can store the water. But remember, that is a, that is a loss of income to store water on the ground. That can't be done FOC. Just have, I know, you over there, you let us flood your, your, all of your farm or two farms and, and, um, and you just suck that one up for, for, the, for the people. And that's not, people will go bust like that. So we need, we, need, um, we need that to be paid for. I love atmospheric rivers. Is that rain? Yes. <laughs> that is definitely my lexicon now. Gosh, have we noticed the atmospheric rivers? Um, <laughs> separating rainwater, this is not new science. Somebody knocked our house down and rebuilt it in about 1750, and they had this marvellous idea about separating the grey water from the sewage, and their health must have been transformed by it. So it seems a bit odd that we're still talking about separating grey water from sewage. You know, this is not, this is not new science. And finally, I'm going to say just a little bit about Know Your Land. That's where we can help. We, you know, at a single farm level, and at, uh, you know, as I said, at cluster levels or group levels. I live on the Helford River in sunny South Cornwall. So it's a, it's a, it's a peninsula called the Lizard Peninsula. 
we have a nitrate vulnerable zone there to prevent the fact that we have a marine conservation zone all around us. We have a high intensity of dairy farms mm -hmm. all around uh, the edge of the lizard. So it's an, and the most botanically diverse area on the Guntindy Downs in Europe. So it's a, it's a very, very special kind of uh, place. Our particular farm starts in a, an old um, dump. So, you know, there's always a problem that the old dump is going to flood and send a lot of toxic stuff back down into the stream that will come floating past us. We live, uh, we have dairy farmers growing silage, which is mostly rye grass, uh, which doesn't, uh, we stopped the growing of maize years ago because of the runoff problem. Uh, we have daffodils growing, but we do incredible amounts of mitigation work before we put in high runoff crops. We're not just sitting there doing nothing. You know, we triple the width of the headlands. We build huge buns with, uh, to try and stop the water and get it into the river. And sometimes that goes wrong. It's not like this year. We had, we had a, a hole come in one of the buns. And the EA were really helpful about it. Because we had done all the mitigation we possibly could. But the weather, the externality of the weather was outside our control. So that goes back to my very first point. Help us to know the land that we're managing. And we will, we spent a very happy set of winter weekends with the kitchen table cleared and big maps and putting in exactly all the different things that were on the land to see how we could manage it more, more effectively. So help the farming and land management communities to, to manage their land in detail and then help them with bodies like the Rivers Trust to collectivise that for everybody's benefit. I don't think it would be very expensive because the cheapest people to deliver this on the ground are the farmers and land managers who by the way are working people even though they have an enormous asset that they can't access so they will be out there from six in the morning until they come home at 10 at night and they will deliver what you need yeah. <laughs> and i'm going to take a few questions from the audience can we just be clear who we're directing the question to where you're from and can it be a question or statement please Okay, for you first. Um, this is for me, Mr. Martin, about transportation. I'm um, sorry, I'll speak up there. Um, and where are you from? I think we've got a microphone here. I don't know. Microphone? Is, microphone. It, microphone. is it plugged in or? Oh, it should be. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Save me shouting. Um, uh, zero percent of our rivers are in good chemical status, and uh, we've got a particular problem with forever chemicals as well. Yeah. Um, since the uh, UK left the European Union, we haven't banned a single harmful chemical and our plans to control PFAS are far weaker in the EU as well. Um, I was wondering whether uh, you could talk maybe a little bit about uh, Rachel Reeves, Reeves' promise during the election to um, seek a bespoke deal with the EU on chemicals and also slightly more generally maybe um, uh, plans on chemical pollution because it's such a severe crisis. Thank you. Yeah, I can do that straight away. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm as concerned as you are about them. Um, it's on my desk at the moment, uh, so I'm sorry that I'm, I'm going to be frustratingly vague, but all I can tell you is I'm concerned too. I'm concerned that other countries and jurisdictions are banning chemicals that we're still allowing in this country. Uh, and I'm looking into what I can do about it as quickly as I can. And I'm sorry, I'm sounding so vague on a lot of those things. And and as for the uh, situation with the EU, then of course, as you know, that's being negotiated with the Paymaster General. So that's that's not, that I'm not personally involved in that, but I am generally concerned about the use of forever chemicals. And I'm concerned at where we seem to be diverging in terms of our regulation on some of these. So sorry, that's not more precise. You know, just very quickly add that there was a chemical strategy which was long in gestation, and um, I'm hoping that might emerge um, as soon as possible. Because, um, that that would be obviously a way of bringing that all together. Yes, but that was previous that government. Was previous government, yeah. And we might not have the same <laughs> aims. Same yeah. data, man. <laughs> if you just pick it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Catherine Fuchs. I'm the MP for Monmouthshire. We've got the Rivers, Why and Usk uh, in, in my constituency. And it was a big part of our election campaign, actually. And Fergal Sharkey came down and he endorsed my campaign. And having endorsed my campaign, I know he's going to hold me to account <laughs> on uh, whether we uh, clean up the rivers. Um, and my question is for Emma and Mark. 
Um, so the previous government brought out a disastrous River Y action plan, which didn't really mean anything. And it was only based on um, what was going on in England. And the River Y is a cross-border river. Rivers are devolved, but not all of the rivers are devolved. So off what, um, as you know, does regulate England and Wales. Um, but a lot of the policy is in Wales. So my question really is about how we create this kind of new partnership and um, how you would both see that happening and whether you think a water protection zone is also uh, an important thing for us because uh, it's something certainly that Friends of the River Y and the wonderful Angela Jones, who's an amazing campaigner on the rivers, uh, are really keen on. Thank you. Do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off with, um, uh, I mean, I think data is fundamental. One of the things that the Y and Ask Foundation, which is one of our Rivers Trust locally has done is collect a huge amount of data. And that's really informed the debate because everyone thought it was a phosphate problem, but actually it's turning out to be a nitrogen problem as much as a phosphate problem. Um, so, and I think data f is fundamental to success across the board. Uh, we really are fumbling in the dark at the moment with limited data. We had massive cuts to the Environment Agency's um, monitoring budget, um, and we need to bring multiple sources of data together. But that data is the starting point, so we really need to understand the problem much better. But then you're absolutely right. We need to bring this together into the catchment partnership. The, the, the previous plan sort of parachuted something in on top of existing stakeholder networks and, and, and social capital that have been established. So, um, I, you know, absolutely, we need to build this from the ground up with the people with the local knowledge and the local connections and the knowledge of local opportunities. And I I'm just picking up on the point that, that um, Victoria made, it's far too much a policy has been kind of devised at a national scale and then imposed. And we've spent a huge amount of money doing things which have achieved very, very little. And so by taking a more local approach, you can really target your interventions at the specific things which which will make it make the biggest difference so we need to identify the sources very clearly and then come up with solutions which are funded by multiple people and deliver them the most benefits that we possibly can yeah um yeah absolutely on the I've mentioned before about the review looking at catchment based approaches <laughs> i'll quote my way through this <laughs> catchment based approaches and i think Mark's absolutely right in terms of how we deliver that. And I think the other good thing to mention is, of course, now we have a Labour government in uh, Westminster and the Labour government in Wales. I think recognising that water doesn't stick to boundaries and it actually goes in and out of different places makes that so much easier. I've already met with Hugh, who's the minister responsible for it in the Welsh government, to talk about how we can develop proper solutions across um, Wales and England. And our Flood Resilience Task Force, of course, had Scotland there as well, because you know, lots of these problems are not confined to the borders that we artificially place on them. So I think having that, yes, from the bottom up, but also having that more collaboration as well across the different nations, I think will, will help. <laughs> Thank you. Just um, I'm I'm Val Bryant. I'm deputy leader of North Hertfordshire District Council, and we have a large percentage of the UK's chalk streams, which means we have got a large percentage of Europe's chalk streams. Uh, our streams are not measured in Olympic-sized pools; more like lanes in your local swimming baths at their uh, widest. Very often, as wide as that that table. Although today is different, we've all flooded. Um, we feel that we've got um, a stewardship of a, a unique resource, a resource which isn't particularly spectacular in most of its its places. I know that Alex knows the area well when she was um, at MEP, and you wouldn't probably notice um, a lot of the short streams, and then they, they, they widen out into beautiful areas. What we need is help with that stewardship, help actually knowing uh, what the threats are and to actually have a plan to deal with it. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, James Wallace from River Action. Um, Emma, uh, rivers are the artery of our economy. Everything that we do requires fresh water. How can we, the NGO community, help you to go to Rachel Reeves
to say, how about getting Steve to not sit at the end of the cabinet table, but sit opposite the prime minister, bearing in mind the environment is the heart of our economy. So what can we do to support you to get the funding we need for ELMS, for example, slurry grants and so on, for riparian buffer zones, for flood management schemes, for beavers, for whatever it is that we need to try and help get over the crisis we face. Thank you. Um, on the, yeah, um, well, I suppose I could sneak in and swap the names, couldn't I? It's just a, no one would notice. Um, yeah, no, you're quite right. And I think when we, I was listening to Steve speak at the, an investment event, and he talked about without water, we have no economy. You know, we, 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 you can't do anything as a country. We can't grow. We can't fulfill labor's missions if we don't have access to clean water. So I think, and the fact I have to say, like every, it's like gossip. Everybody wants a bill in this parliament because every single department is saying like, you know, they want to push forward their priorities. So I am, I think I said this the other day, so chuffed that we got one and we got to announce one so early I, because it shows that we've been given some priority because of course I don't know if you know how all this works but it's all a bit of a hustle and bustle into who gets their thing where and it kind of reminds me of and I'm using a teaching analogy of trying to when you're trying to sort of calculate the timetable for the children across the whole of the different year groups and you're working out what bit goes where that's what kind of happens with legislation it's like when can we do that bit and how long will that bit be and when can we, you know and the fact that we got there when we've been given that in the first 100 days, I think shows that it is a massive uh, priority to the Labour Party and the Prime Minister's given it as one of our one of our first pieces of legislation that hopefully, all being well, will get royal assent by January, which is amazing within the first six months of a Labour government that we've passed legislation in this space. So it definitely is. And as, yeah, absolutely wanting to work with the ENGOs, I've, I've, said that you know steve's spoken about co-creation co-production how we can do things together I, you know I, i'll freely admit i don't have the answers to everything but i know out there you guys do and if we can have that almost hive mind and bring all of that knowledge together we can create something really meaningful that will change and yes it is a challenge and it is going to be difficult but I, you know i've got faith that we can we can crack on with it I come with it together. Um, and I don't know if, you, Mark, you're probably the best expert talking about chalk streams. Is that is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I um, absolutely um, hear you about chalk streams. Uh, um, I mean, they are our coral reefs, our, our rainforests in terms of global rarity. We have 85% of the world's chalk streams um, in England. Um, and, um, you know, they're really precious places. And I remember really clearly being, you know, when I was young, snorkeling down a, a chalk stream and just being amazed at the kind of the life within them. And so many of them are degraded. They don't have special protection. Um, under the last government, we bought through a chalk stream uh, recovery pack, um, which has um, lingered um, uh, in DEFRA um, and never made it out before the election. So we'd really love to see that brought forward. And that had a number of, you know, complex measures that deal with all the things which affect chalk stream health. So, um, uh, you know, they are really special places and we have a global responsibility, I think, to look after them far better than we do. We've got one last question. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, James Robinson, I'm a dairy farmer from South Cumbria um, and I'm also the uh, chair of the England Nature Friendly Farming Network. Um, Great to see farmer representation on the panel. I was worried until I saw Victoria that wasn't going to be any. Seventy percent of the of the UK is farmland. Everything that you want doing has to be done through farmers. But we, as an industry, despite some really good stuff being done, and it's been done in spite of the system, not because of it. How do we? How do you empower farmers to do that work when the budget for agriculture is? Three billion. You said you were going to spend three billion on Manchester alone. That's one one city in one area of the country, and yet we, as an industry, are supposed to clean up everything to do with agriculture, sort out soil, sort out everything that we've got to do, grow the food and everything for the same budget as one city. You know, there's there's such an in, in, such an inequality really um, coming down to us as farmers, the ones that can deliver that. How are you going to empower farmers to actually make the change? I've talked a lot, but I'm I'm uh, happy to come in. But I'm here, keen to hear Victoria's. Yes, I think um, uh, uh, let's start with the answer, a bit, shall we? Um, and with Nature Farming Friendly, with Nature Friendly Farming, which has been a very influential uh, group. Yes, it is th uh, to do with 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 making sure we have the budget to deliver, and also because this is such a broad um, audience, I'd like to to kind of 
to, to bring this back to everybody and not to talk about farmers and the farming community as if we are the villains or the victims of this piece. We are the people who can provide the answers to this and, 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 and we do. Uh, if we try to quantify what we're already doing for nothing, FOC, that is a huge sum of, of, of money. We're going into a, um, a, a, a project at, at home the project won't start until later in the year. The contracts aren't signed. We started the actual work eight months ago to make sure that we could get going. So there's a lot of work that's being done out there, which is not being charged to anybody. But if we get the, the money for Elms, proper money for Elms, if when um, the, uh, the Nature for Climate Fund is folded into that budget, don't take it away from what's already there. Add it on. Otherwise, you're just selling everybody short further down. But we have the ability, we have the solutions, and best of all, we have a next generation who just fill me with hope about what they can do. They can do it. They're going to be fine. We just need to put those pathways in for them. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, it's a great example because I don't think that the public funding, not subsidy, but the public funding which farmers receive is going to increase. But I think there are huge opportunities to overlay that with lots of private finance. And there's an example from just up the road from here in Lancashire. Um, there's a town called Churchtown, which suffered um, three one in 50 year floods in 20 years and untold misery. They didn't qualify for hard engineered flood defences because it wasn't deemed cost beneficial to do so. So what we did was bring together with um, United Utilities in uh, um, uh, another pilot project, um, but I think this could be the norm, to bring together, we got some green finance investment, and then we've got lots of buyers of ecosystem services to pay for that landscape to be really transformed. So we spent about a million and a half on the, t on the, uh, at the top of that catchment, transforming the landscape with funding from the Woodland Trust, um, from uh, Sainsbury's who want to replenish the water they use, from United Utilities who are worried about the resilience of their sewage infrastructure downstream, um, from the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee. So we pooled lots of different funding, transformed the landscape, and we did it in partnership with farmers. And it's amazing that the Rivers Trust there has, is on first name terms with 90 farmers. And farmers actually go out and volunteer on other farmers' land to build hedges and buns and work with the Rivers Trust with this funding that we've received. And it's transformed that landscape and transformed the flood risk um, for a city. So that is the approach that we need to take, is to, is to pool that money, to give farmers the long-term certainty. And crucially, those measures were implemented in partnership with farmers. So they weren't saying, we're gonna slap this in here, whether you like it or not. They were saying, you know, we want to hold this much water. Where could we do that that would fit with your operation? And, you know, the farmers involved have been really appreciative of, of, of that approach. And you only get that by working locally, but with the big money being brought together at a, at a regional scale. And Mark, would you like to make some closing comments? God, I think I've said enough. I've not said <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, I mean, I think I'll leave it at that and just th thank everyone for, for coming along for your passion and enthusiasm and, and to the entire panel for, for giving up your time and particularly the Minister for uh, in a very busy schedule with a, a, a failing voice. But uh, it was great to hear your words. Thank you. Thank you very much.